Well, church, I, w- I want to take the few minutes that I have left, and we are going to end what has been the longest sermon series I've ever preached in my life. We're in a sermon series called The Twelve. And this is week 12, so if you're a guest, you got here just in time. Call it the dramatic conclusion. Uh, It's not the shortest of the books, but it will be the shortest sermon because we're doing church again in 45 minutes. This is the, the, now I've said this before, but if you're wondering why I call this series the 12, it's not because it's 12 weeks. It's because the minor prophets, the last 12 books in our Old Testament, are just one book in the Hebrew Bible, and it's called the 12. And so the minor prophets speak uh, to God's people over, over several generations. And a lot has happened since we started this series. In fact, I went back and looked at my notes. In week one of this series, I was announcing that we were getting ready to receive a miracle offering the next Sunday so that we could purchase land for building a new building. Well, praise God, that offering was collected, that land's been purchased, and, and now you and all of our new members are gonna have to have a vote here in a couple weeks to say, hey, let's go ahead and take out a loan for the next 30 or 40 years. Doesn't that excite you? But we got to talk about that stuff because God's moving the church forward, and we are excited about where we're at as a church. Today, uh, we're in the last one. We've gone all the way from uh, Hosea. That was Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah. Now we are to Malachi, the last of the twelve. And like so many of the minor prophets, here's what I love about Malachi. He preaches to stir the hearts of God's people from apathy back to renewal. And can I just say, that's one of my desires for New Life Sunday. Every time we have a day like this, we're celebrating what God is doing, what God wants to do in people's lives. My prayer is that it stirs something up in all of us, that we're inspired to take the next step. Let me give you the first verse. He opens with these words, Malachi chapter 1 and verse 1. And it says this, a prophecy. The word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. Now you can read all the history of what happened in this context if you read the books of Nehemiah and Ezra. Under their leadership, the people were able to finish building the temple. They were able to build the wall around the the city. And now we're a hundred years after the time they started. A hundred years later, a century has gone by since they've returned from exile in Babylonian captivity. And now they're back in in, in Jerusalem and, and life is moving along. And what maybe started out really strong has now started to grow cold. I don't know if you can relate to that. But how many of you know like, it, it, like January 1's coming and we're going to run into the year with all of this gusto and fervor and intention and declarations. And it's, this is going to be different. And then like February 1 comes and you're like, what was I going to do this year? You know, I gotta, well, that was, that was the people of God. A hundred years into it, their hearts have grown cold. Worship had actually become a chore to them. They lost their passion for God. They lost their passion for God's people. And it's into this moment that verse 1 comes and it says, The word of the Lord comes, or the word of the Lord came to Israel. Can I just say, that's what we need to reignite our hearts. We need the word of the Lord to come to us. We, we don't, you don't need somebody to just come up here and hype you up. You don't need the worship team to just, you know, get everybody clapping and jumping. You need the word of the Lord to come to you to bring new life. Paul said in Romans 1, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it's the power of God unto salvation. It's the gospel that saves. And we need the word of God. How about this? How about we just commit on New Life Sunday to be a church that lifts up the word of God and lifts up the God of the word. That's what we're about. We're about God's word. That's why we took 12 weeks to walk through some of the most obscure passages of the Bible because we understand that it is all the counsel of the Lord and it's all good and it's all profitable, amen? So the whole book of Malachi, it, it, here's what's interesting about this book if you've never read it. It's only four chapters. I'd encourage you, you can read it today. But what's interesting about it is it's written in a debate format. 
which maybe that's a bad analogy today because a debate right now sounds like a meaningless conversation about nothing. But it's actually purposeful. And what I mean by a debate format is God makes a statement and then the people ask a question and then God answers the question. And this goes back and forth like six or seven times. That's the outline for the book. But this, there's 23 questions in the four chapters, only 55 verses in the whole book and 23 questions. So it's a debate back and forth. But within the conversation between God and the people of God through the prophet Malachi, there's several things that we learn about God himself. Uh, I'm going to just mention some of them to you and you can study this out on your own. But the first one thing we learn about God is simply this, God loves you. God loves you. Look at verse 2. God says to them, here's his first statement, I have loved you, says the Lord. But you ask, how have you loved us? And that's kind of the format for the whole book. God makes a statement, and then they respond, how? And then God explains. And the way that God explains it is he recounts Israel's history to them. He tells them about their past. And then he points out some of the things that are happening currently in their lives. And then he begins to remind them about the prophetic words that were spoken about their destiny. So essentially God says in the first chapter, I've loved you in the past, in the present, and in the future. It all testifies to this reality. I've loved you. That's what I love about New Life Sunday. We get a chance to kind of look back and hear some stories of where people have been. And then we get to celebrate together what God is doing. And then we get to leave this place pretty excited about a God who can do those things. We can trust him with tomorrow. Amen? So God says, I've loved you. Look at your life. It testifies. Then the second thing that we learn about God is this. God deserves your best. What had happened was Israel was not giving God their best. In fact, they were bringing their worst. In verses 6 through 11, God says, even the priests, the leaders in the temple, they dishonor me. Because the priests in Malachi's day, uh, to them, serving God had become such a burden. It had become such a, a chore. I mean, they had to deal with all the livestock for everybody's offering. If you got livestock, you got to feed them. You, get, you, know, you got to water them. And, you know, there, there's other stuff to clean up on the backside of all that. And you know what I'm saying? Like, they didn't want to do the chores anymore. And in Malachi chapter 1, verse 13, he says, And you say, what a burden. And you sniff at it contemptuously, says the Lord. You ever felt that way? Don't raise your hand, but come on. Have you ever felt that way? You felt like serving God was a burden? You know, maybe, maybe, you, maybe you felt that way yesterday when you got your notification on Planning Center. Reminder, you're scheduled to serve in the 830, and you're like, you sniffed your nose at it. You know, that's what they were doing. It wasn't a joy to serve the Lord. Some of y'all are falling under conviction right now. I can feel it. You're like, oh, oh, kill me. Right? That's what they were doing. They're like, I don't want to, oh, come on. I got I to serve on Sunday? Yes, you get to serve the King of Majesty on New Life Sunday. But that's not how they felt. They, they, they didn't want to go through all of the hassle of serving God's people and doing all these things. And so what did they do? They did what we start doing. They cut corners. And they didn't do it with the same attitude of excellence that the Lord deserved. Look at the rest of verse 13. He said, here's what they were doing. When you bring injured and lame or diseased animals and you offer them as a sacrifice, should I accept them from your hand, says the Lord? So in other words, instead of bringing God their best, instead of bringing him the the paschal lambs, the ones that are the most pure, the firstborn, the ones set aside and prepared, they would just like find the most diseased, like, well, that, that, that cow's about to die anyway. Let's just take it to the temple real quick. We'll offer it up as a sacrifice. Count it. And God's like, no, I don't count that. That's not your best. Did you think I needed another offering? No, I'm looking for a heart of worship. I'm looking for a heart of sincerity. When you bring me some diseased animal and you call that good, when you tip God instead of tithe to God, and you say, oh, that's God's word. That's good enough. I'll just throw him a little extra on the side. God says, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm looking for the priority of your heart. Man, I wish I had about 15 more minutes to talk about that, but you can just chew on it for a while. This afternoon when you read Malachi, 
How about this? Let's just not forget why we worship. Let's not forget why we sing these songs, why we give in the offering, why we serve on the teams. He is worthy of our very best. He's worthy of it. We get get one shot at this in this life, one chance to give God all we have. He's given us new life. He deserves your best. Here's the third thing that Malachi teaches us about the Lord through this debate with God's people. He teaches us that God is serious about his word. You don't have to come here long to know we're serious about the word, but we're serious about the word because God is serious about his word. And so here's what he says to the priest. Essentially, he says, I'm, ju- I'm going to judge you because you haven't honored me. And, and he points them back to the covenant he made with the Levites. The, the Levites served as the, the priests. They were the ones that took care of all of the, essentially, they would be the, the, the leaders in the church if it were today. He said, Levi, he, had, he revered me. He, Levi honored me. He spoke the word of God clearly. He walked in purity. But he says to him in chapter 2 and verse 8, but you've turned the people away from the truth. In fact, as the spiritual leaders, you've caused the people to stumble. So he says to them, like, the word matters. Look at verse 9 with me in chapter 2. He says, so here's what's happening. I've caused you to be despised and humiliated before all the people because, here's why, you have not followed my ways. But you've shown partiality in matters of the law. Listen, God has given his word to guide our lives. So if we're not going to follow in his ways, if we're going to reject his word, that's the same as saying, God, I reject your authority in my life. That, that's what we're saying to the Lord. Like, I, no, I, I, you know, I, I, I love you, God. I'm glad you're my savior. I just don't want to listen to you. That, that's, that's not making him Lord of your life at all. So God says, I I care about my word. Jesus said, you are my disciples if you keep my commandments. He didn't say you're my disciples if you get baptized in water or if you take a discipleship class or if you join a church. He said, the way you're going to know your mind is that you obey what I tell you. Now, none of us are perfect. None of us get it right all the time. But how many of you know we ought to be living our lives submitted to the authority of God's word? Over culture, over family, submitted to the authority of God's word. Now, the next charge against Israel is that they've been unfaithful. They've been unfaithful to God. They've been unfaithful to each other and And here's what we learn. God honors faithfulness. He honors faithfulness. Faith is the currency of God's economy. Faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, the Bible says. You have to have faith. He honors faith. In fact, in in chapter 2, in verses 10 through 16, God says five times you've been unfaithful. Five times he says unfaithful. And I'll just show you the most stunning image out of all of them. It's in verse 13 and 14. God says this, another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears. Well, that doesn't sound like a bad thing, right? You weep and you wail because he no longer looks with favor on your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands and you ask why maybe you've been there before like man i'm praying i'm calling out to god i'm attending church why isn't he answering and then malachi tells them it is because the lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth you've been unfaithful to her though she is your partner the wife of your marriage covenant this is not a metaphor All right, this is as clear as it's written in front of you. The people of God were being unfaithful to their wives. The men of Israel were leaving their Jewish wives and they were marrying foreign women. They were breaking their marriage vow. And not only were they just breaking the marriage vow as if that were not enough, now they were being unequally yoked with unbelievers. And those unbelievers were introducing to them idol worship. Or what today we might just call like worldly ways 
of, of, of doing things. They were desecrating the sanctuary of God's temple because they were introducing all of these things that were like additions to the way that God had said he would be worshipped and honored. And, and so now here's the men. And their lives aren't working. Gee, I don't know why. And they're coming to God and they're falling down at the altar and they're weeping. These crocodile tears are going, God, you got to help me. God, you got to fix my life. And how many times have I seen people do that very same thing? Show up in a crisis moment, maybe on a Sunday morning like this, and say, God, I, I need your help. And listen, nothing wrong with that moment. I believe in moments, okay? you got to start somewhere. And if your life's falling to pieces, the best thing you can do is find an altar, shed a tear, get back on your prayer bro bones, and trust God again. And just say, God, I'm, I'm not getting up until, until I, I feel your touch on my life again. We need that moment. But how many of you know that moment of shedding crocodile tears in the altar is never going to be enough if you get up from the altar and you choose to live a life of disobedience to the will of God? You, you can never make up for that. You can never sing loud enough. You can never serve enough. You can never worship enough. You can never cry enough tears or pray enough prayers. God is looking at the hearts of us today just like he was looking at the hearts of them. And God honors faithfulness. The, the next statement that he makes after he tells us these things about God really reveals the whole motivation for the book. It's in Malachi 2.17. He says this, You have wearied the Lord with your words. You've wearied him. And how have we wearied him, you ask? By saying, all who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord. And he's pleased with them or saying, where is the God of justice? So what he's doing now, is he's calling out the two extremes in the people of God. The first extreme is they just think, well, God doesn't really care what you do or how you live because God loves us. And isn't that a popular message today? He just loves us. That's such an open-ended statement. He loves us. Que sera, sera. Whatever will be, will be. No standards, no, no expectations from the Lord. Why? Because he loves everybody. And he said, that's what a lot of you are saying. Just doesn't matter how I live my life because God loves us. The other extreme is this. They're saying, well, if God is good, why is there evil in the world? Why is God not punishing the wicked? And so God responds to this and he goes, You're, you weary me. That's the, that's the word of the Lord. You are exhausting. Have you given that word from the Lord to your children before? You, you weary me. You felt like the father in that moment. You didn't know it, but you were reflecting God. You, you weary me. That's how he looks at us. Like his kids just exasperate him. Why? Because you think I don't care about what you do, but then you get offended when I don't judge other people for what they do. Wow. Like God, we want grace for us. We want justice on them. And God says plainly in, in chapter 3 and verse 6, one of my favorite verses, he says, I am the Lord, I don't change. Like, I, I, I'm not this guy on Sunday and this guy on Friday. I, I'm, not, I'm not loving and passionate and gracious and, and hospitable to this group and then uh, wrath and justice and truth to this group. I, I don't change. You can experience my mercy if you'll turn to me, or you can experience my wrath if you rebel and turn away. And then he says very clearly here in chapter 3, verse 7, what he has said through most of these prophets we've been studying for these 12 weeks. Verse 7 of chapter 3, he says, Ever since the time of your ancestors, you've turned away from my decrees and you have not kept them. Here it comes again, one more time in this series. Return to me. And I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. How many times have we heard that? God is saying to his people and he's saying today in this service, return to me. Return to me. Come back. It's not too late. If you can hear my voice, respond today. Return to me and what? And I will return to you. 
A lot of people think, I can't come to God. God won't accept me. God won't, God won't do this, or I've done too much. God says, look, just return to me. If you will return to me, I will return to you. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Amen? His grace is greater than sin. Just return, he says. But like they have all through this book, they respond. But how, you ask, how are we to return there in verse 7? And then something really interesting happens because after they say, how do we return? He launches into a teaching about tithes and offering. Yeah. Don't get nervous. We've already collected the offering today. We're not, not dear like, oh, I've seen this on TV. I know where this is going. I know where this goes. He's wrapping it up. Cue the musicians. Here comes the big ask. Like, is that what it is? Like, how do we return to you? And then he starts talking about tithe and offering. Is that what it's all about? Like, we're supposed to just give our money and, and God's good? Listen, just as much as God didn't need their lame sacrifices on the altar, God doesn't need your meager bank account. How many of you know he owns the cattle of a thousand hills and the word said the silver and the gold is mine, says the Lord. He owns it all anyway. So he's not after your wallet. He's after your heart. And here's the reality. You can fake sincerity in the singing. You can fake sincerity listening to the sermon. It's hard to fake generosity. You're either giving or you're not. And so God just goes right to the heart of the issues. He says, you want to know how, how you're not honoring me? You want to know uh, how you're not turning to me? You're robbing me. You say I'm first in your life, but I'm last in your bank statement. And so God goes right to the issue of their heart. And then in verse 13 through 15, God just... He continues to hear them complaining. They're saying this to the Lord. They're saying, serving God, it just isn't worth it. Maybe you felt that way before. Serving God's just not worth it. It's not worth it. And then Malachi says, God hears all that, but there's another group he hears too. Look at verse 16 of chapter three. Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. That is such a powerful verse. It tells us a few things. It says right now, the Lord is listening. And think about this. In heaven, he says, minutes are being taken. Like when the people of God come together, when the people of God come to, whether it's on a Sunday morning or a conversation in the lobby or a life group that's meeting in someone's home, he said, yeah, I hear all the people complaining, but I also hear my people, they're coming together. And when my people come together, I listen and I take notes. A scroll of remembrance is written in my presence. And then he says this, it's concerning those who fear him and honor his name. In other words, not only does he listen and our notes taken, but he sees our heart. He sees if we're just going through the motions or if we really have a reverent fear of the Lord and that we honor his name. And then you move into the last chapter and it opens with these words. It sounds so minor prophety. He says, surely the day is coming. Just one of those great statements we read through the minor prophets to say, surely the day is, in other words, time is running back. Hear the, it's running out. Hear this message. Time's running out. Hear the message. This day is coming. This is not just, this is not just hype. This is not a, a prophetic scare tactic. He said, the day is coming. And then the final, the final word in the Old Testament, Malachi's the last book. After that, it's a blank page in my Bible. And then we start the New Testament. So the last word that God speaks is a reiteration of two things. It's a reiteration of his word and his promise. Look at verse four of chapter four with me. It says, remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees that I gave at Horeb for all Israel. Remember them, he said. In other words, don't forget God's word. 
Heaven and earth will pass away, Jesus said, but my words will never pass away. Remember the law. Remember my words. And then in verse 5, he says, See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. So first he says, remember my word. And then he says, remember my promise. What does Elijah have to do? I mean, Elijah's, you know, dead and gone by this point. What does Elijah have to do with the promises of God? Well, after Malachi says this, God goes radio silent for 400 years. He doesn't say anything else. I'm like, Malachi says this, remember the word of God and remember the promises of God. I'm going to send Elijah. And then God says nothing for 400 years. No prophetic declarations, no dreams, no visions. The last of the 12 have spoken. And then all of a sudden one day, an angel appears to a man by the same name as one of the minor prophets, a man named Zechariah. He's standing at the altar, and an angel appears to him and tells him, your wife, even though she is past childbearing days, is going to have a son. He's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Name him John. And the angel begins to tell Zechariah about this boy, and in telling him about the boy, he quotes Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. He quotes the last thing God said 400 years before. And in Luke chapter 1, verse 17, the angel says, And he will go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. In Matthew eleven fourteen, 14, Jesus said, John is the Elijah who was to come, the one who would prepare the way for the Lord. So God's last message in the 12 is keep the commands and watch for the king. He's coming. And then he closes the book until the day that Elijah comes in the person of John the Baptist, and prepares the way for the Lord. And, and, and I, I, love the, I love the simile here. It's the same for us. Because Jesus did come. He was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He did miracles. He, he taught the people. He prophesied his own death, burial, and resurrection. And then he ascended bodily right back up to heaven. And so as they were waiting for him to come that time, we're waiting for him to come again. In fact, as he was ascending up into heaven, Acts 1 verse 11 says, angels appeared to those disciples that were standing there watching him. And they said, men of Galilee... Why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who's been taken away from you will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. And you know what they did? They got busy keeping the commands and watching for the king. That that was the response. As it was in Malachi, so it was in Acts. For the church age, we are to obey the word of God and watch for the coming of our king. As we end this service today, I just want to remind you, I need to remind someone of what the Lord wanted to communicate to his people. He wants to communicate to you today. God loves you. Your past, your present, your future, they all communicate this reality. He loves you. He deserves your best. Come on, the New Testament says don't grow weary in well-doing. Maybe some of you have grown weary in serving the Lord. Let New Life Sunday be a day to just catalyze your heart again to say, come on, he's worthy of my best. I'm not giving him the leftovers. I'm giving him the first fruits of my life. I'm giving him my best in my time and my talents and in my treasure and my resources because I know he honors faithfulness. Someone needs to be reminded of that. You feel like you've been overlooked. You've been faithful. You've been doing the right things. And it looks like God hasn't shown up. God keeps great records. There's a scroll being written in his presence of every conversation of his faithful people. He honors faithfulness. But he's serious about his word. 
So he calls out to us again, like he called out so many times to the prophets, return to me. Return to me and I'll return to you. So I want to give you an opportunity as we end this service to just accept that invitation. Would you bow your head with me in this moment? If the Lord has been dealing with your heart, he's been calling you back to him, the invitation is simple. Today, take advantage of this opportunity to call on the Lord from a place of faith. Faith is the currency of the economy. You don't have to have the right words. You don't have to impress the Lord. You could never do that. But if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, the Bible says you will be saved. Your sins will be forgiven. Your name will be written on a scroll in heaven. Your past will be gone, and behold, all things will become new, the Bible says. So if that's you today, you say, I need to give my life to Jesus this morning. I'm going to ask one time, and then we're going to pray. If that's you, would you raise your hand right now and say, Pastor Aaron, that's me. I'm in this service this morning because I need to surrender my life to Jesus. That's why he brought me here. That's why he brought me here today. It wasn't for baptisms. It wasn't for celebrating new members. It, he brought me here to hear this message. The Lord's saying to me, return, and I'll return to you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for just being sensitive to the Lord. Right now, every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Church, would you pray with the, these several that raised their hands? Come on, let's say this to the Lord together. Say, dear God, I surrender. I return. I give you my life. And by faith, I believe my sins are forgiven. Today is a new day. I have new life in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Come on, if you love the Lord and what he's doing today, let's give him praise for that. We got to give him praise for that. Come on. Amen. Amen. Stand up with us today. As we, as we get ready to end this service, I'm going to ask our prayer team to come and find a place to serve folks in the front of this room and in the front of each aisle. Let's, let's end this service the way we end this series. Let's trust in his word and his promises. Come on, let's obey his commands and let's watch for the king. This prayer team is up here today because we want to just take the next few moments as we're even transitioning between services for personal ministry. If you're here today and you say, man, I... I need God to do a work in my life, or maybe a work just began. If you raised your hand a moment ago, this prayer team has some materials they'd love to put in your hand to help you to take the next step. That prayer that we just prayed, it, it was a good starting point, but you need to know how to take the next step. So if you raised your hand a moment ago, or maybe you needed to, to say, I want to begin again with Jesus, would you find one of these prayer partners and let them put a resource in your hand before you head home today? Let's end this service as we're all standing. I, I want you to hear this verse out of 1 Thessalonians 3, 8. It says this. Paul said, it gives us new life to know that you are standing firm in the Lord. Isn't that, isn't that true, church? Doesn't it give all of us new life when you see what we've seen today? God, we thank you for the new life in Christ Jesus. More to come, Jesus. Do it again. Do it again and do it again until you come back for your bride, the church. Lord, do it in us. Thank you for new life as we see so many standing firm in their faith today. In Jesus' mighty name and all God's people said amen. Come on one more time. Let's give him praise this morning. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. God bless you, church. Have a wonderful day.